Welcome back to Pastor Emily's Story Hour. We're reading Emily of New Moon by L. M. Montgomery. Chapter 17 Living Epistles Dear Father, I have such an exciting thing to tell you. I have been the heroine of an adventure. One day last week, Ilsa asked me if I would go and stay all night with her because her father was away and wouldn't be home till very late, and Ilsa said she wasn't frightened but very lonesome. So I asked Aunt Elizabeth if I could. I hardly dared hope, dear father, that she would let me, for she doesn't approve of little girls being away from home at night, but to my surprise she said I could go very kindly. And then I heard her say in the pantry to Aunt Laura that it is a shame the way the doctor leaves that poor child alone so much at nights. It is wicked of him. And Aunt Laura said, the poor man is warped. You know, he was not a bit like that before his wife... And then, just as it was getting interesting, Aunt Elizabeth gave Aunt Laura a nudge and said, Shh, little pitchers have big ears. I knew she meant me, though my ears are not big, only pointed. I do wish I could find out what Ilsa's mother did. It worries me after I go to bed. I lay awake for ever so long thinking about it. Ilsa has no idea. Once she asked her father, and he told her, in a voice of thunder, not to mention that woman to him again. And there's something else that worries me, too. I keep thinking of Silas Lee, who killed his brother at the old well. How dreadful the poor man must have felt. And what is it to be warped? I went over to Ilsa's, and we played in the garret. I like playing there because we don't have to be careful and tidy like we do in our garret. Ilsa's garret is very untidy and can't have been dusted for years. The rag room is worse than the rest. It is boarded off at one end of the garret and is full of old clothes and bags of rags and broken furniture. I don't like the smell of it. The kitchen chimney goes up through it and things hang round it, or did, for this is all in the past now, dear father. When we got tired of playing, we sat down on an old chest and talked. This is splendid in daytime, I said, but it must be awful queer at night. Mice, said Ilse, and spiders and ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts, I said scornfully. There isn't any such thing. But maybe there is for all that, dear father. I believe this garret is haunted, said Ilsa. They say garrets always are. <laughs> Nonsense, I said. You know, dear father, it would not do for a new moon person to believe in ghosts. But I felt very queer. It is easy to talk, said Ilsa, beginning to be mad, though I wasn't trying to run down her garret. But you wouldn't stay here alone at night. I wouldn't mind it a bit, I said. Then I dare you to do it, said Ilsa. I dare you to come up here at bedtime and sleep here all night. Then I saw I was in an awful scrape, father dear. It is a foolish thing to boast. I knew not what to do. It was dreadful to think of sleeping alone in that garret, but if I didn't, Ilsa would always cast it up to me whenever we fought. And worse than that, she would tell Teddy and he would think me a coward. So I said proudly, I'll do it, Ilsa Burnley, and I'm not afraid to either. But oh, I was inside. The mice will run over you, said Ilsa. Oh, I wouldn't be you for the world. It was mean of Ilsa to make things worse than they were, but I could feel she admired me too, and that helped me a great deal. We dragged an old feather bed out of the rag room, and Ilsa gave me a pillow and half her clothes. It was dark by this time, and Ilsa wouldn't go up into the garret again. So I said my prayers very carefully, and then I took a lamp and started up. I am so used to candles now that the lamp made me nervous. Ilsa said I looked scared to death. My knees shook, dear father, but for the honor of the stars, and the Murrays too, I went on. I had undressed in Ilsa's room, so I got right into bed and blew out the lamp. But I couldn't go to sleep for a long time. The moonlight made the garret look weird. I don't know exactly what weird means, but I felt the garret was it. The bags and old clothes hanging from the beams looked like creatures. I thought I need not be frightened. The angels are here. But then I felt I would be as much frightened of angels as anything else. Then I could hear rats and mice scrambling over things. I thought, what if a rat was to run over me? And then I thought the next day I would write out a description of the garret by moonlight and my feelings. At last I heard the doctor driving in. And then I heard him knocking round in the kitchen, and I felt better, and before very long I went to sleep, and I dreamed a dreadful dream. 
I dreamed that the door of the rag room opened and a big newspaper came out and chased me all around the garret. And then it went on fire and I could smell the smoke plain as plain and it was just on me when I screamed and woke up. I was sitting right up in bed and the newspaper was gone but I could still smell smoke. I looked at the rag room door and smoke was coming out under it and I saw firelight through the cracks of the boards. I just yelled at the top of my voice and tore down to Ilsa's room and she rushed across the hall and woke her father. He said, damn, but he got right up. And then all three of us kept running up and down the garret stairs with pails of water and we made an awful mess, but we got the fire out. It was just the bags of wool that had been hanging close to the chimney that had caught fire. When all was over, the doctor wiped the perspiration from his manly brow and said, that was a close call. A few minutes later, it would have been too late. I put on a fire when I came in to make a cup of tea, and I suppose those bags must have caught fire from a spark. I see there's a hole here where the plaster has tumbled out. I must have this whole place cleaned out. How in the world did you come to discover the fire, Emily? I was sleeping in the garret, I said. Sleeping in the garret, said the doctor. What in, what the, what were you doing there? Ilsa dared me, I said. She said I'd be too scared to stay up there, and I said I wouldn't. I fell asleep and woke up and smelled smoke. You little devil, said the doctor. I suppose it was a dreadful thing to be called a devil, but the doctor looked at me so admiringly that I felt as if he was paying me a compliment. He has queer ways of talking. Ilsa says the only time he ever said a kind thing to her was once when she had a sore throat and he called her a poor little animal and looked as if he was sorry for her. I feel sure Ilsa feels dreadfully bad because her father doesn't like her, though she pretends she does not care. But, oh dear father, there is more to tell. Yesterday, the Shrewsbury Weekly Times came, and in the Blair notes, it told all about the fire at the doctor's and said that it had been fortunately discovered in time by Miss Emily Starr. I can't tell you what I felt like when I saw my name in the paper. I felt famous. And I never was called Miss in earnest before. Last Saturday, Aunt Elizabeth and Aunt Laura went to Shrewsbury for the day and left Cousin Jimmy and me to keep house. We had such fun, and Cousin Jimmy let me skim all the milk pans. But after dinner, unexpected company came, and there was no cake in the house. That was a dreadful thing. It never happened before in the annals of New Moon. Aunt Elizabeth had toothache all day yesterday, and Aunt Laura was away at Priest Pond visiting Great Aunt Nancy, so no cake was made. I prayed about it, and then I went to work and made a cake by Aunt Laura's receipt, and it turned out all right. Cousin Jimmy helped me set the table and get supper, and I poured the tea and never slopped any over in the saucers. You would have been proud of me, Father. Mrs. Lewis took a second piece of cake and said, I would know Elizabeth Murray's cake if I found it in Central Africa. I said not a word for the honor of the family, but I felt very proud. I had saved the Murrays from disgrace. When Aunt Elizabeth came home and heard the tale, she looked grim and tasted a piece that was left, and then she said, Well, you have got some Murray in you after all. That is the first time Aunt Elizabeth has ever praised me. She had three teeth out, so they will not ache any more. I am glad for her sake. Before I went to bed, I got the cookbook and picked out all the things I'd like to make. Queen pudding, sea foam sauce, black-eyed Susans, pigs in blankets. They sound just lovely. I can see such beautiful fluffy white clouds over Lofty John's bush. I wish I could soar up and drop right into them. I can't believe they would be wet and messy like Teddy says. Teddy cut my initials and his together on the Monarch of the Forest but somebody has cut them out. I don't know whether it was Perry or Ilsa. Miss Brownell hardly ever gives me good deportment marks now, and Aunt Elizabeth is much displeased on Friday nights, but Aunt Laura understands. I wrote an account of the afternoon when Miss Brownell made fun of my poems and put it in an old envelope and wrote Aunt Elizabeth's name on it and put it among my papers. If I die of consumption, Aunt Elizabeth will find it and know the rights of it and mourn that she was so unjust to me. But I don't think I will die, because I'm getting much fatter, and Ilsa told me she heard her father tell Aunt Laura that I would be handsome if I had more color. 
Is it wrong to want to be handsome, dearest father? Aunt Elizabeth says it is, and when I said to her, Wouldn't you like to be handsome, Aunt Elizabeth? She seemed annoyed about something. Miss Brownell has had a spite at Perry ever since that evening and treats him very mean, but he is meek and says he won't kick up any fuss in school because he wants to learn and get ahead. He keeps saying his rhymes are as good as mine, and I know they are not, and it exasperates me. If I do not pay attention all the time in school, Miss Brownell says, I suppose you are composing poetry, Emily, and then everybody laughs. No, not everybody. I must not exaggerate. Teddy and Perry and Ilsa and Jenny never laugh. It is funny that I like Jenny so well now, and I hated her so that first day in school. Her eyes are not piggy after all. They are small, but they are jolly and twinkly. She is quite popular in school. I do hate Frank Barker. He took my new reader and wrote in a big sprawly way all over the front page, Steal not this book for fear of shame, for on it is the owner's name. And when you die, the Lord will say, Where is that book you stole away? And when you say you do not know, the Lord will say, Go down below. That is not a refined poem, and besides, it is not the right way to speak about God. I tore out the leaf and burned it, and Aunt Elizabeth was angry, and even when I explained why her wrath was not appeased. Ilsa says she is going to call, call God Allah after this. I think it is a nicer name myself. It is so soft and doesn't sound so stern, but I fear it is not religious enough. June 14th. Dear Father, we have composition in school now, and I learned today that you put in things like this when you write anything that anybody has said. I didn't know that before. I must go over all my letters to you and put them in. And after a question, you must put a mark. And when a letter is left out, an apostrophe, which is a comma up in the air. Miss Brownell is sarcastic, but she does teach you things. I am putting that down because I want to be fair, even if I do hate her. And she is interesting, although she is not nice. I have written a description of her on a letter bill. I like writing about people I don't like better than about those I do like. Aunt Laura is nicer to live with than Aunt Elizabeth, but Aunt Elizabeth is nicer to write about. I can describe her faults, but I feel wicked and ungrateful if I say anything that is not complimentary about dear Aunt Laura. Aunt Elizabeth has locked your books away and says I'm not to have them until I'm grown up, just as if I wouldn't be careful of them, dear father. She says that I wouldn't because she found that I was reading one of them and I put a tiny pencil dot under every beautiful word. It didn't hurt the book a bit, dear father. Some of the words were dingles, pearled, musk, dappled, intervales, glen, bosky, piping, shimmer, crisp, beechen, ivory. I think those are all lovely words, father. Aunt Laura lets me read her copy of A Pilgrim's Progress on Sundays. I call the big hill in the road to White Cross the Delectable Mountain because it is such a beautiful one. Teddy lent me three books of poetry. One of them was Tennyson, and I have learned the bugle song off by heart, so I will always have it. One was Mrs. Browning. She is lovely. I would like to meet her. I suppose I will when I die, but that may be a long time away. The other was one called... Sorab and Rustum. It was just one poem. After I went to bed, I cried over it. Aunt Elizabeth said, What are you sniffling about? I wasn't sniffling. I was weeping sore. She made me tell her, and then she said, You must be crazy. But I couldn't go to sleep until I had thought out a different ending for it. A happy one. June 25th. Dear Father, There has been a dark shadow over this day. I dropped my scent in church. It made a dreadful noise. I felt as if everybody looked at me. Aunt Elizabeth was much annoyed. Perry dropped his too soon after. He told me after church he did it on purpose because he thought it would make me feel better, but it didn't because I was afraid the people would think it was me dropping mine again. Boys do such queer things. I hope the minister did not hear because I am beginning to like him. I never liked him much before last Tuesday. His family are all boys, and I suppose he doesn't understand little girls very well. Then he called it New Moon. Aunt Laura and Aunt Elizabeth were both away, and I was in the kitchen alone. Mr. Dare came in and sat down on Saucy Sal, who was asleep in the rocking chair. He was comfortable, but Saucy Sal wasn't. He didn't sit on her stomach. If he had, I suppose he would have killed her. He just sat on her legs and tail. 
Sal yowled, but Mr. Dare is a little deaf and didn't hear her, and I was too shy to tell him. But Cousin Jimmy came in, just as he was asking me if I knew my catechism, and said, Catechism, is it? Lawful heart, man! Listen to that poor dumb beast! Get up if you're a Christian! So Mr. Dare got up and said, Dear me, this is a very remarkable thing. I thought I felt something moving. I thought I would write this to you, dear father, because it struck me as humorous. When Mr. Dare finished asking me questions, I thought it was my turn, and I would ask him some of the things I've wanted to know for years. I asked him if he thought God was very particular about every little thing I did, and if he thought my cats would go to heaven. He said he hoped I never did wrong things, and that animals had no souls. And I asked him why we shouldn't put new wine in old bottles. Aunt Elizabeth does with her dandelion wine, and the old bottles do just as well as the new ones. He explained quite kindly that the Bible bottles were made out of skins and got rotten when they were old. It made it quite clear to me. Then I told him I was worried because I knew I ought to love God better than anything, but there were things I loved better than God. He said, what things? And I said, the flowers and the stars and the wind woman and the three princesses and things like that. And he smiled and said, but they are just a part of God, Emily. Every beautiful thing is. And all at once I liked him ever so much, and I didn't feel shy with him any more. He preached a sermon on heaven last Sunday. It seemed like a dull place. I think it must be more exciting than that. I wonder what I will do when I go to heaven, since I can't sing. I wonder if they will let me write poetry. But I think church is interesting. Aunt Elizabeth and Aunt Laura always read their Bibles before the service begins, but I like to stare around and see everybody and wonder what they are thinking of. It's so nice to hear the silk dresses swishing up the aisles. Bustles are very fashionable now, but Aunt Elizabeth will not wear them. I think Aunt Elizabeth would look funny in a bustle. Aunt Laura wears a very little one. Your lovingest daughter, Emily B. Starr. P.S. Dear Father, it is lovely to write to you, but oh, I never get an answer back. E.B.S. Come back tomorrow for Chapter 18.